I tell you what, I wish I had the clout to just count it off again and make the band stay up here and go one, two, three, four. I, I love that line in that song. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way he loves me. Good grief, y'all. Y'all glad to be in church this morning? Yes. That's a word just to get right there, isn't it? Uh, well, good morning, church. Are you glad to be here, really? Come on. I'm excited to be here, too. I hope you're having an awesome day. And I really, I really, man, I feel God in the, in the building. And I think, I think that's important that he's here this morning. We're currently in a series entitled Unsung Heroes, where we are celebrating the less recognized heroes in the scriptures, people who God used to make a lasting difference in the lives of others and, and that really used them to change the world. I have loved uh, discovering, going back and reading stories that I've read many times, but discovering the people behind the scenes that really exacted change, that exacted action in the story really made a difference. I've loved learning how these people with very little little recognition, very little, uh, little acknowledgement or applause, how they changed the course of history of people's lives, how they changed the world, really. So far, we've learned a few things. Can I do a real quick recap? This is super quick. Are you ready? Yep. Unsung heroes, number one, unsung heroes share truth no matter the cost. In the story of a man named Stephen, we're told in Scripture that when, when facing certain death, he decided to share the truth that he had, which was what? Which was Jesus Christ was the Son of God and came to save the world. That's what he had, and that's what he shared. And it was heroic that he did that. Uh, the second thing we learned is unsung heroes make unexpected differences. And the thing I, I believe really stood out in that scripture and that story was this, is that ordinary people doing ordinary things, being ordinarily obedient to God, wanting to just take care of Jesus, they were given an incredible message to share with the world. They were given an incredible responsibility by God and they went and did it. They went and shared that message. These women that were a part of Jesus' ministry made a lasting difference in the world. The third lesson we learned last week is unsung heroes see, thirst, and quench it. People, unsung heroes, I'm telling you, are people that are just walking in their day-to-day -day and they look to their left and their right and they see someone who's in need, someone who's searching, someone who's thirsty, thirsty for God, thirsty for hope, thirsty for peace, maybe just a kind word, maybe just a good day, maybe just, to some, maybe just thirsty for someone to say, hey, I see you. But when they see that, they don't, just ignore, they don't just ignore it, they don't just walk past it, they actually stop. And they do something about it. They do their part to quench that thirst. Y'all remember all that? Everybody caught up? Yes. Good. The next uh, lesson or, or message I felt like God wanted me to share this morning was actually given to me through my wife. I had several stories rolling around in my mind that I felt like I wanted to share and uh, different little unsung heroes in scripture and things I was thinking about. And I was just talking to Brittany about it going down the road and she said, I really wish that you would tell the story. In 1 Kings chapter 17. And I was like, okay, well, whatever you want me to do, I'll do, you know, no, no. <laughs> It works that way most of the time at our house. But I thought about it. And I thought about that story and I ran it through my mind. And I thought, you know what? I think you're right. I think there's something there I'm supposed to share. In, in truth, the person in 1 Kings 17 truly does stand out to me in the world of unsung heroes. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to tell the story a little differently today. I'm going to tell the story from the hero's perspective. Is that okay? Uh, well, this is what I mean. In 1 Kings 17, the story is kind of told with the, with the main character of the story uh, being at the center of the story. And I think if you just read it that way and you don't look at it from the perspective of the hero, you actually miss some things. I think there's some things that you won't see or you won't see it from their perspective. So today, if it's okay, I'm going to do that. Is that okay, church? That means I'm going to do some paraphrasing. That means I'm going to use a little bit of imagination, okay? So don't get weirded out if you're looking at 1 Kings 17. I would encourage you to do this, though. Read it for yourself. Check me on it, okay? So I'm going to tell the story this morning. Is that okay? Here we go. 
One day, a woman from the town of Zarephath in the region of Sidon woke from another poor night's sleep. She hasn't truly rested in a long time. Worry has overtaken her mind. Every moment of every day, her mind is overtaken by worry. Actually, that's probably putting it mildly, Ernie. Uh, The truth is, every day she is panicked. Every day this woman is agonizing over her and her child's life, their situation. And this day that she wakes up, This is the day that she has feared for months. It has come. You see, this woman, she was a widow. She was widowed some time ago. And things for her and her son have continued to get worse, it seems, since the day her husband and his father passed away. Things have just gotten worse day after day. As many of you know, being a widow in this time in history, in this culture, being a widow at at this time, it is is, uh, more than unfortunate. Can I say that, Scott? It's more than just unfortunate. It's it's like a prison sentence. It is a sentence to a hard and unforgiving life if you're a widow. If you didn't have a man in your life to take care of you, it's just the way the world worked. That means that this woman, this widow, she labored, she scrounged, even had to beg on a daily basis in order to make it through the day. Are you with me? Everybody with me? The plight in her, you got to understand, the plight of her mind and, and the struggle of her body was to survive. She was trying to survive every single day. Not just for her, though. For her son, Matt. She's got to survive for her son. To have a child in this time as a widow, all alone, as you can imagine, only compounds the problem, Chris. It only makes it worse. You have another mouth to feed. You have someone else to care for. You have to worry about where they are and what they need every single day. And as you, many of you know, young children don't always understand the depth of the poverty you're in. They don't see the struggle that you're in, right? They don't know how desperate your situation is. And this mom, she is trying desperately to keep that from affecting her son. It's not just about her. She's a mother which means any pride or ego she had before this is wiped away. She's just trying to survive and keep her son alive. Her impoverished situation continues to prove limiting and finding a husband, a husband that would want her and what she's got going on, a husband that would want her already having a son, another mouth to feed. She's, I'm telling you, she's trying to dig out of the hole she's in, but every day it just gets worse and worse and worse. I'm telling you, you ever been in a situation in your life where it seems like you're just down in this hole and somebody handed you a shovel? And every time you dig, you're just getting deeper and deeper. The problem gets messier and messier. As I said, it was difficult to be widowed and alone in this time in history, in this culture especially. But man, when hard times strike the economy, the nation, when when hard times hit the farming economy, it proved deadly for widows and orphans. For this mother and son... The town of Zarephath, the rains haven't come for a long time. You know that? It hasn't rained in ages. In the the entire region, it hasn't rained in, in months. That means that crops aren't growing. That means that food is scarce. That that means that hard times have really struck. 
and Zarephath. Which means people like her, it would be fatal. We understand from history that even during this time, people with means, people with means were struggling. Day after day, this widow watches as her own body, her own strength diminishes. She's doing her best to ration the food. She's doing her best to even give her son a little bit extra, but she can feel that her body and her strength is leaving her. You understand? She can even see in her son that he looks malnourished, that his ribs are showing, that his skin's turning gray from lack of nutrients. You understand? That's why this day in 1 Kings 17, that she rises from a sleepless bed on this fateful morning. She goes through her routine to make sure everything is as normal for her son as it can be. Right? She gets up. She gets the house ready. She, does, she pulls her hair back. She puts on her head scarf. She gets a little cup of water, sets it by the bed for him. So he's got something to drink that morning. She kneels and she kisses him. And she heads off into her place to pray. As I believe she did often. You with me, James? She talks to God. And I believe she asked God uh, for his deliverance. I believe she's trying to trust God. God, you've got to help us. I mean, the day is here. This is the day I've been worried about. This is the day I've been praying about. And I believe this. I think this is something that she's done regularly. But the truth is the cupboard has continued to grow more and more empty. As she completes her prayers on this morning, though, something happens. She feels God speak to her. Now, I don't know how it happens, guys. I don't know if he speaks uh, in, into her mind or, she feel, or if he, she actually hears the audible voice of God. But I know this. It's clear. She knows exactly what God has said to her. She hears the voice of God with clarity. Maybe a clarity she's never heard before in her life. But the truth is, God doesn't address her needs or her struggles. God doesn't make any promises to her. God doesn't encourage her, it seems. Instead, we're told in Scripture that God instructs the woman. He gives her instruction. And the instruction has nothing to do with her or her son, it seems. Can I tell you, honestly, God gives her a simple, unimaginable instruction. Actually, Tim, just Tim talking... God gives her a ridiculous instruction. It's ridiculous. Like even I read the scripture and I go, that's ridiculous. <laughs> he tells her something that had to be meant for someone else, man. I mean, it had to, God had to get his wires crossed. You know, he put an extra I in the email or something like, I don't know. Like it got delivered to the wrong address. You know what, the, you know what he instructed the woman to do? This, this is what he told her. He said, you're going, into a run, you're going to run into a man soon. Feed him. Feed him. What are you talking about? The widow can't believe that this has been shared with her. She must be the least likely person in all of Zarephath to have something to feed somebody. This makes no sense. She can't believe that this is from God. Does he not know her situation? Does, she not, does he not see her plight? Does he not understand what the cupboard looks like? Feed him. She don't have any food. She's always imagined hearing from God and it being exciting, Leanda. You know what I mean? Uplifting, encouraging, like his radio. Like he's always imagined that it was going to be like that. But this, this is confusing. God, how am I supposed to do this? She doesn't see the means. She doesn't have the resources. She doesn't even know who he's talking about. You want me to... Make matters worse, man. You want to do this? You want me to do this for a stranger? For somebody I don't even know? I'm going to see a man soon? Like, what are you talking about? 
I thought of it this way this week. This command from God sits in her mind as an exclamation point behind a question mark to the question she's been asking for months. You ever write a sentence like that where you ask a question and you put an exclamation part, a, a point behind it to be like, this is a serious question, you know what I'm saying? That's what this is. That's what this command is from God. It's that exclamation point to the question, which is, why are you letting this happen to us? Why? Why are we going through this? Why are you letting this happen to, to my son? He's innocent. The widow gathers, gathers herself. She wipes her eyes. And she reserves her mind, I believe, to not let her son see. Not today. Today's an important day. She's been preparing for this day for weeks. And she knew there was no stopping it. We're told in scripture that the woman, she heads just outside of the town gate and she's gathering some sticks. And, I, and I've thought a lot about this part of the story. I think she goes out to the town gate and I think there's this part of her that secretly hopes that maybe today is the day that somebody who's doing just a little better, somebody who's got just a little bit of means, sees her and just helps her out. You know, throws a dollar her way or has got some extra food and just sees her struggle, sees how desperate she is, sees her poverty and just goes, you know what, I'm going to help you today because I'm telling you, it's been dry for a while at the gate. But she goes out and she's gathering sticks and the people that come by, they avoid eye contact with her. Much like we avoid eye contact when we see people. In similar situations, you know, so we don't have to be reminded of how desperate and heartbreaking some people's lives are. Everybody walks on by and she continues to gather sticks. And we're told that she bends over to pick up a stick that a shadow of a man appears. She turns to look expectantly. And when she looks, she sees the most gangly, rangy, rank looking dude you could possibly i'm talking about a guy that looks like he's been living in the woods for a real long time like she smelled him before she saw him you know what i'm saying he's <laughs> got dust everywhere you know what i'm saying looks like he needs to be beat off beat with a broom before he comes into town. You know what I'm saying? She's sizing him up and he asks a question. Verse 10, read this with me. He says, would you bring me a little bit of water in a jar so I may have a drink? The widow, I think she looks at him intently and she answers quickly. You can't miss this. She answers really quickly, not with her words, but with her actions. We're told in scripture, she turns to go get the man of water. And so I guess if you wanted any clues that this woman may be an unsung hero, there it is because she sees thirst and what's she going to do? Quench it. I'm just, I can't make that up. She's like, I can do water. I know where water is. She goes to get water. Look what it says in verse 11, though. It says, as she was going to get it, he called, and, br and bring me, please, a piece of bread. This stops her in her tracks. She remembers what God told her to do. She remembers her instructions. But this doesn't make any since I believe with all my heart that the widow begins to weep and she turns around and she's going to share with this stranger she's going to share with this man listen you need to know what's going on verse 12 she said as surely as the Lord your God lives you know what she's saying I heard from God I know what God's telling us to do I believe in God as surely the Lord your God lives she replied I don't have any bread only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug I'm gathering a few sticks today to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat and die. The fateful day. The day that she's been dreading. What 
was the day of her was the day of her and her son's last meal together. That's what she knew. We're going to eat a meal together today, and then we're going to die. We're going to starve to death because there's nothing left. And there's nobody to help us, and there's nobody to save us. Now, let make sure you understand, when I say meal, you need to see it for what it is. She had a handful of flour, and she had just a little bit of olive oil. She had enough to make a cake of bread for her and her son to split Enough just to keep their systems working for a day or two. Today was the day that their fate was sealed. There would be no more food. They would have very little water. And a short time before they both starved to death. This woman, this widow, this mother is at an impasse. I believe in my heart that she desired to do what God had instructed. But for the life of her and her son, it just doesn't make any sense. What do I have to give? I don't have anything left to give. The gangly stranger spoke to her again. Read what he said. He said, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first, don't miss this, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself. And your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Now, this widow has the most important decision of her life, I believe, in that moment. As she's walking home, church, do you think she's scared? You think any doubt may be creeping in? Do you, you think she might be wondering, is this, is this what you want, God? Is this what I'm supposed to do? You think she's praying as she's walking? How's God going to do this? How's this going to work? But we're told in Scripture, the woman goes home, she mixes the flour and the oil. She looks at her son. She makes a cake of bread. She wraps it up and she leaves to take it to the stranger. She takes him this bread and she turns around and she goes home. Back to the cupboard. She opens it. And we're told in scripture that the exact amount of flour and the exact amount of oil that was in the jar that morning was back there. There was enough remaining for her and her son to have a loaf. And this is what it says. It says that, so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is what it tells us. From the, for the remainder of the drought, for the remainder of this famine. You see this? Listen. For the remainder of the drought and the famine that this region was in, that they were going through, God works miraculously to keep oil and to keep flour in the jars and fed all three of them. Now, I want to tell you what I think that means. That means that this woman's act of faithfulness, that her choice that she made resulted in saving this stranger Elijah and her son. In my opinion, she is absolutely, Donnie, an unsung hero of the Bible. Because the truth is, the impact of her decision the impact of her sacrifice goes far beyond what you and I could ever imagine. The stranger to her was the prophet Elijah to us, right? And when you read that story, you understand that, that Elijah 
had just had words with the king of Israel and, and he had shared with the king of Israel that they had, they had led the people away from God and because of that, God was going to use a famine and a drought to draw them back and so Elijah was kind of the source of this famine, you know, and God using him for that. And I think sometimes when you read this story, if you're not careful, Elijah comes out the hero. And you look and you go, yeah, well, it's the prophet Elijah. Of course, this, duh, this widow should have done that. She should have helped him. She should have made these sacrifices. She should have done all those things. But here's what you can't miss. She didn't know any of that. She was just a woman trying to survive. A woman trying to take care of her son. The only reason this woman had to help this guy was God said so. Did you hear me? Don't miss that. The only reason, the only thing this woman had to go on was her faith. Her faith in what God told her to do. She had no reason to give the last of the little she had in the middle of her own suffering. Other than God spoke to me and told me to. I think that tells us something about unsung heroes. I think it tells us a lesson that is a good one to end on today. Can I share it with you, church? Yes. Unsung heroes trust God with the last of it. Unsung heroes trust God with the last of what they have. Time after time we see in Scripture that a hero, a hero practices this obedience that causes them to give or share the last of what it is they have. So many of the heroes in the Bible, and especially the obscure heroes in the Bible, came to a place where they were nearly out of time, nearly out of life, nearly out of strength, nearly out of breath, nearly out of money. They, were, they, they had nothing left to give, it would appear. And, but all of a sudden, as, they, as they're pressing on towards the end, God says, hey, share it, give it, speak it. Hand it over to me. And they're faced with a decision. Do we give the last of what we have to God? Do I use this last bit of strength? This last bit of time? This last bit of money? This last bit of go that I have in me? Do I give that to God? Do I trust Him with it? And it's in those moments where they give it to God. Where they share it. Where these heroes do that. Where God uses them in the grandest ways. In the most incredible, most impacting, most life-altering ways. In my opinion, I'll tell you this. Giving of your time, your energy, giving of your life to God, giving of your money to God. Any, any sort of act that we have of giving, I think, is a commendable, generous, great thing. But when there's nothing left to give, when you look and you don't see how you'll survive, how you'll make it, when it takes from those that you love and you give anyway to God in obedience to Him. Now, in my opinion, that's heroic. This is a theme throughout the Bible. Jesus himself pointed it out at the temple one day. There were all these dudes coming into the temple and they were giving to God. They were bringing money to give to God. They had great big bags of coins and they had all this stuff. And they were doing a lot of, a lot of you know, making a scene of it, bringing the money and putting it in the box and making sure it jingled and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, here comes this widow. Can't be a coincidence, right? And we're told she drops in two widow's mites, which monetarily are worth very little. Very, very little. And Jesus pointed her out. He said, hey boys, look. Look, don't miss it. Look. She gave more than all the rest. The disciples were like, yeah, it didn't look like it. Jesus said, no. She gave more than all the rest 
because it was everything she had. That's what the widow, widow in Zarephath did. She gave all of what she had left to a stranger. Being an unsung hero is all about faith. Every story, guys, that we've told you over the last four weeks are about faith. It means trusting God in the most dire of circumstances. It means trusting God when your life is on the line, if you share the truth. It's trusting God uh, with normal, obedient things in, in the hopes that he will use you in some great way. It is trusting God and sacrificing yourself for someone else. Sacrificing your comfort your time, your energy for somebody else. And it's having a faith that's willing to give the last of whatever it is you have. That's what these people did in Scripture. There is nothing more life or death, more in all than trusting God with the last of whatever it is you have. Can I be honest with you guys? Just talk for a second. Pastor to church, is that okay? You know what this story made me do? It made me assess my own faith. I asked myself this question. Tim, would you be willing to give the last of it? Would I? If I got down to my last dollar, and I felt like God wanted me to give it, would I give it? You know? If I got down to my last piece of bread, and I felt like, and God asked me, hey, I want you to give it. Would I be able to do that? Would I be able to look into my daughter's eyes, seeing their hunger, seeing what they need? Would I be willing in my faithfulness to God? Would I trust God enough to take and give him the last of it? Standing in front of you, church, i got to be honest with you, I'd love to tell you yes, but I don't know. i got some selfish in me. I get scared. I asked myself, I said, man, would I, am I, would I ever be able to trust God with the last of whatever he's given to me? The last of my life, the last of my strength, the last of whatever it is I have, would I be willing to do that? And I honestly don't know. I'd like to. I'd like to have that kind of faith. I could see where that kind of faith would come in handy. This thought hit me, too. I've never been there. I've never been to the end of me, the last of it. I never had it. I spent some time just thinking and talking to God about this message this week, and I was like, God, you know, I don't know that I would. I don't know. And I've never been there. I've never experienced that. You've blessed me in such a way that I've never, I've never just found, the, you know, been placed in a situation where it required that kind of faith for me. And I said, but God, here's the thing. I want that. I want to be that kind of person. I want to have that kind of faith. Uh, but I prefer you not put me in that situation, but I'd like to be there, you know. I said, but God, how do I, how do I make sure? How do I make sure in case this world turns upside down, and think, in case things go completely sideways, how can I make sure that no matter what, that I have that kind of faith in you? I tell you, I think God told me something. I think he spoke to me. You know what he told me? He said, trust me with the first of it. You want to trust me with the last of it? You worried about a day that may come where I look at you and say, I know you got nothing left, but give me what you do have. He said, I tell you what to do. Make sure you trust in me with the first of everything you got. Make sure that whatever you've got around you right now, make sure that you already trust me with that. Make sure that you're trusting me with your marriage. Make sure you're trusting me with your children. Make sure that you're trusting me with your bank account. Make sure you're trusting me with your job. Make sure you're, tr make sure you're trusting me 
with those decisions that you've got to make this week. Make sure you're trusting me with whatever, wherever it is, I got you right now. I can promise you this. There is faith that is required for you to walk in it the way God wants you to walk into it. There is faith that is required in order for you to do whatever it is. If you've got a struggle going on in your life right now, Tim, if you've got something that you're battling, you've got something that you're trying to deal with or sin you're trying to, you need to try, start figuring out how to trust me with that right now. Because one day things may get serious. One day you might, might find yourself in the middle of a famine with nothing left in the cupboard. And the only way there's any hope that you have faith enough to trust me with the last of it is if you've been trusting me the whole time. If you've trusted me with the first of what you've been given. Now I want to tell you why I think God's placed this on our hearts. There's some people here this morning and there are areas of your life, there are things in your life that you have withheld from God. You're still in control. You're still in management. You still decide the rations. You're still trying to be married your way. You're still trying to parent your way. You're still managing the money the way you need to want to manage the money. And in no way are you allowing God to lead you in that. In no way are you allowing God to trust you. I mean, trusting God with it. I want to tell you something. It's a dangerous way to live. What God wants is he wants every piece of you. He wants every piece of your life. He wants every, he wants every relationship, every conversation, every decision, everything that he's placed you in charge of. He wants every bit of that ran through him. That's faithfulness. And I'll tell you this. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed if you trust him with it. You begin to allow him to lead you in those areas of your life. You'll be amazed at the difference he makes through you. You may very well, in your own faith, in your own opportunities to trust God, discover that you become someone's unsung hero just because he's leading you in all those areas and in all those things that's the way it is if everybody will every head bow and all eyes closed I want to do something this morning we got a few minutes here I want to open up the altar this morning I want you to feel free I don't say this the altar is always open up here you ever feel like you're here and you need to come pray you come do it but I'll tell you, there's some people here this morning and you need to hand some stuff over to God. You've still been managing. You've still been in the one in control. You want a relationship with God. You want to be a person of faith. You want to be a person that God uses to make a difference. But the truth is, you know you haven't trusted Him the way that you should. You haven't verbally said to him, hey, God, this is something I want you to be in control of. I want you to begin to lead me in it every day of my life. If that's you this morning, you're here, and you know you need to bring some things before God, I want you to have the opportunity to come up here to the front. I want to challenge you to do it this morning. We got time. If you feel the need to come up to the altar, I want you to do it this morning. I want you to understand something. God's looking at you. And he's begging you. You need to let go of this. That empty cupboard, that worry, that weight that you're trying to carry all on your own, I see you. I've got you. He wants you to hand it to him. He wants you to trust him with it hi if you can't see this man we got some people up here at the altar I'm telling you we're going to take a minute with it right here with them 
We have some people in our midst that are hurting. Some people who are making some decisions or some things that they need to just hand to God that they want to trust Him with. You may be here this morning and, and maybe it's, it's not that you feel like you, you haven't been trusting God with it or, or that you haven't been faithful. Maybe you just need a minute. Maybe you just need some time to be up here with Him. We would love to have the opportunity to pray with you right here. God, I want to pray for each person that's right here. This is what I know. No matter what they're facing, no matter what they're going through, no, no matter what area of their life they're feeling pressed in, that they're struggling in, this is the truth. Your word. Time with you. Time with other believers who support and encourage you. searching God for how you would lead us searching and asking just turning our eyes to you every day and going God what would you have me do right here with this God it makes all the difference it makes all the difference it changes our lives it moves us forward it grows our faith and I can't think of anything more important right now, right now in this day, in this time, than for our faith to be as strong as it can possibly be. So my prayer is, God, is that you will draw us in that way. That we'll be drawn into your word, drawn into conversations with you where we rely on you. That you will, you will show us the questions to ask, God, and you will give us the instructions on what to do. And whatever those instructions are, God, that we'll do it. We'll do it faithfully trusting and believing that you are in control that you're taking us where you want us to be God that's my prayer God continue to grow our faith continue to build us up so we can be people of impact that make a lasting difference in the lives of others in Jesus name Everybody says, amen. Church, I'll tell you this. We're not going to rush them off. I love you. I hope you have a great day. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Bye-bye.